Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our Navigating the Holidays webinar. I'm Chris Turner, the host of the Empowered Parent Podcast, and joining me as always are Ryan and Kayla North. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Chris. So uh, I guess let's get started. Let's do that. <laughs> so um, so one, one of the reasons we wanted to do this thing is because um, our... Um, you know, kind of like, you know, see a need, meet the need. And for the most part, a lot of what we've, we've gone uh, and learned about and, and developed some strategies for is because we were trying to meet some own needs in our own family. Right. And, uh, and so um, this navigating the holidays thing is something that, you know, super uh, important to us because we're about to enter the holiday season this week. <laughs> Absolutely. There's that. And um, it is a, um, a really difficult time of the year for our kids and it's supposed to be peace on earth goodwill to men and all that stuff but the truth of the matter is for a lot of our kiddos um, it's a reminder that things went wrong right because mm -hmm. for the first time um, they don't you know they're reminded that they're not around the people they were born to they're not allowed around their, their biological families and uh, we tend to see uh, corresponding behaviors. And so one of the first times Kayla and I noticed this is when our son, um, which was just really kind of, um, was really tough between about, um, you know, Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. Uh, no, that's not true. His birthday's in January. It was Thanksgiving <laughs> and his birthday. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, we started paying attention. You know, we tell people all the time, you have to be the world's leading expert in your children. And so in, in our attempt to understand him, um, and to and to make the world a better place for him as best we could, we started noticing these trends. And so, um, we want to talk a bit about that tonight, and, and give some practical advice on how I, how you guys can uh, can um, you know work through some of that stuff. How you can share some stuff with your uh, with your extended family that that you're going to be around starting this week. Uh, we have some resources that that Kayla wrote that we'll share at the end with everybody, um, as well as a replay. So. Okay, do you want to, just before we get into the presentation, you talk a little bit about, about kind of, you know, how we started figuring out we had to navigate the holidays? Well, I think every year, just like you said, it was, we just had a bunch of, of all of a sudden we would be like, why is this so horrible? Why are we fighting with everybody? Why is this always just craziness? And then when we started realizing, oh, it's that time of year, there's these traditions that we have that, you know, as soon as the Christmas tree goes up, all of those kinds of things things started getting a little, a little crazy. Mm -hmm. So, Hey, um, before we start, can okay. we have everybody, everybody know where the chat feature is down at the bottom? You can see there's like a little chat, um, throughout the whole thing. If you have a question, if you'll just like type it into the chat, we're going to have a Q and a at the end, but we're going to kind of look through those. So if a question comes to mind that you want us to talk about at the end, if you'll just jump over to the chat, but before we even do that, would everybody just kind of on the chat, just type where you're where you are from um just where so you're we, calling in from yeah where where <laughs> you're where you're from we want to hear where everybody's from that's in here so we can just get to know everybody just for a second okay well um part of part of the, the navigating the holidays as um those of you who are um or, um, you know, listeners to the podcast will know that we are super huge proponents of not just looking at our kids, but looking at ourselves. And the better we understand ourselves and the, the more able we are then able to work through our histories. And, and they don't have to be traumatic and tragic, but there are things in our, in our histories that were just, you know, adverse childhood experiences that we need to be aware of. And a lot of times uh, Christmas and uh, Thanksgiving is hard for us um, and coupled with the issues we bring to the table um, with the issues that um, that our kids are bringing to the table um, you know that that makes for for a pretty uh, pretty volatile situation and you know so a couple of things happen one we started paying attention to how our kids were doing at Christmas time uh, and two um, we started paying attention to how we were doing at Christmas time and so um, I'll never forget never forget when Kayla told me um, that I was, uh, what, no fun at Christmas? Ruining Christmas? I what think I said you were ruining Christmas. <laughs> oh, seriously. I'm very gentle that way. <laughs> uh, for those of you who know Kayla, um, you know that she is mostly gentle, uh, but she was not with her spouse that time. 
and so um you know um but but that was a real aha moment for me i certainly did not like hearing it um but at the same time um at least you know in a moment of clarity thought i should at least consider it so um okay, okay. <laughs> I'm so thankful you know, for that. <laughs> you know, you, you know what's better than having Chris laugh at you is watching Chris laugh at you because he has delight all over his face right now. Um, and so, um, you know, I thought about that and why is Christmas hard for me? And um, and we'll get to get into that just in a little bit. Um, we want to also just let you guys know um, all the ways that you can reach us and interact with us. So. Uh, there's one big happy home.com info at one big happy home.com if you have a question or uh, the Facebook and the Twitter. I probably should put the Instagram up there too, but um, let, let me guess it's one big happy home. Uh, it is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could it's you very creative? Yeah, I, I didn't even think about Instagram. Do you, know why, do you know why that is because you don't post it? I'm over 40. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyhow. Uh, there's my age joke for the evening. Um, so there's all the ways that you can uh, get hold of us again, uh, interact any of those places. If you have questions, um, we'll share some resources at the, at the end here. Kayla, do you remember all of the things that we have promised that we will share? The resources? Yes, ma'am. We have, a, we have t uh, 12 days of connection. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, and, and, and you're working on a letter, right? Is there a song that goes with it on the first day of connection? <laughs> my... That would be good. Will you work on that, Chris? Uh, sure. On okay. the first okay. day of connection, my mommy did. So <laughs> I'll, I'll throw that together by the end. Now, we have a 12 days of uh, connection guide for you. And then I also have a um, just kind of a resource for extended family. So for those of you that maybe want to um, help prepare extended family in advance, we've got um, a little resource that we'll share there as well. And then anybody that needs training certificates, we'll get those out to you as well. Yeah, and, and you should have told us when you signed up if you needed those or not. So um, we will make those out and email those out to everybody. Um, okay. So you want to do um, introductions? Sure. This is my family. Um, this picture is a few years old. The kids are not this young anymore. Um, but uh, the one there sitting in front of me, with the glasses on, that's Davis. He is our oldest. He is our biological child. Um, he's now 15. Uh, and all the things that come along with being a teenager are, are definitely present in our home. Uh, sitting on Kelly's lap uh, is Samuel. Uh, he is our domestic adoption. Uh, he was adopted from Atlanta, Georgia. And then uh, sitting on my lap is our international adoption that is nathaniel and he is from rwanda and uh so ages current ages are uh, 15 10 and 7. yes my apologies i went and got this from your facebook that's okay <laughs> <laughs> all right and then um kayla do you want to introduce our tribe yes Sounds like, there we go all right well that really tall one that's ryan <laughs> Um, and then the one that's the next tallest, that's Tyler. He's our oldest. He just turned 16. And then next to him in the denim jacket is Tori. She'll be 14 actually in a couple of days. And then in front of Tori, that's little Libby. Uh, Libby just turned six in September. And then the one that looks like she's got some little Minnie Mouse ears, that's Addie. She's looks like anime characters. <laughs> <laughs> is she or Princess Leia or something? I don't know. She's Addie is seven. And the next Addie is Josh, and he is 10. And next to Josh is Brooklyn, and she is also 10. And the nice-looking blonde woman in the middle is, of course, the lovely Kayla. For those of you who don't know what the lovely Kayla looks like. All right. So um, here's something that um, we are truly, really big believers in, uh, and that compassion is a deeply held belief, and empathy is the skill set needed to bring compassion alive and so um the reason that we love sharing that quote throw, sharing that quote excuse me um is because a lot of people um, have sympathy for for kids in foster care or kids who are adopted um and so sympathy is a great starting point but it is not um really the the, the sum total of what the kids need because feeling sorry and we say this all the time and for those of you guys who listen to the podcast will know this too that um, sympathy 
does feels great and it's a great starting point, but it doesn't really help you um, when little Johnny's peeing on the wall next Tuesday. <laughs> right. Um, and the only reason um, that I use little Johnny peeing on the wall is because, um, well, it's a real story. <laughs> it's not made up. Uh, let's, just, let's just leave it at that. So um, what we need, though, is to move from sympathy to empathy. And so the dictionary definition of compassion is that it is a feeling of sympathy that becomes a desire to alleviate another person's suffering. And that empathy part is where you move from feeling sorry for the child to choosing to see things from their perspective and choosing to see the world from their point of view so that you can do something to make the world a better place for them, right? It's the story of Jesus. We're not going to get into that a lot, even though um, we celebrate his birth at Christmas. So maybe we can talk about Jesus for a minute here. But, um, you know, the Bible says that he, when he, saw the crowd he had compassion on them so he taught them he saw the crowd compassion on them he fed them he saw the woman grieving for her son and he had compassion on her so he raised him back to life so um, those are some of the, like the really really great things and so uh, we love quoting dr brown um she's fantastic Brene brown and um just to any of you who have kids if you want to watch some of her stuff on youtube um she does use mid mid-level cuss words <laughs> so just uh, be fair warned do you want to give that disclaimer because um if um, your children start using new colorful language as their Christmas gift to you, <laughs> don't email us. We did warn you. Uh, but she is fantastic. Just watch you with some headphones on. Uh, what a darling little girl. Yes. I don't know about you guys, but that's not what Christmas looks like at our house. <laughs> no. Um, we have some cute little blonde haired girls like that, but um, it's not what Christmas looks like at our house. Um, gift receiving has not always gone quite that well. Um, wearing the cute little outfits and actually wearing the gloves and the jacket when it's cold definitely doesn't happen at our house. Um, and I think one of the things our pastor said recently that I really um, resonated with was we need to parent the child we have, not the child that we want. Right. And oftentimes when we start to... Um, get into this time of year, we have this idealized version of what, you know, like that Norman Rockwall uh, Christmas picture, right? And everything's going to go great. And we're going to do all these really fun things. And my children are going to just love Christmas and it's going to be wonderful. And, and then you everyone's find, smiling all the time. All the time. Yes. Because I mean, candy blows and that just yeah. makes everyone happy. Rivers right? of chocolate. Right. I mean, we just, we have this idea of what Christmas is going to look like. And, and in our head, somehow we have this picture of this, this perfect Christmas and it, it's not what happens, right? It's not the ideal Christmas is not what happens. And so then we're disappointed. We, um, we, we don't parent the kid that's in front of us that has the needs that we need to parent, but instead we parent the kid we wish we had. Mm. We parent the, be, we parent the child hoping that we're going to get the behaviors that we wish we had. And so then everything starts to get turned upside down. And I think because of our, our complicated histories, um, we also, to some degree, parent the child that our parents wish we had. Right. Right. Yes. And, and or parent the child our grandmother wishes that we had. And, um, you know, that's just a ton of pressure. And um, that's just not something um, that, that, that's really fair of the children because the holidays are hard enough, right? It's a reminder that they don't get to see their birth grandmother. It's a reminder that they don't get to see their birth mom or their birth dad or, or any of those people, uh, maybe a sibling, right? Mm -hmm. and because even though our kids uh, may have been hurt in physical or emotional ways, we cannot forget that, that those are the people who they were born to. And there is, is, some level of bond there and there is some level of attachment there and they do miss them and they do think about them. And one of the things I think that's really great that we can do is ask our kids, Hey, are you thinking about your, your grandma today? Yeah. Cause I yeah. did that. I did that last son last week and I said, are you thinking about your birth mom? And he kind of, you know, sort of talked about it for a minute, but, but to say to our kids, Hey, I know you're thinking about your, your family and that's okay. Yeah, and just give them, give them permission. Permission, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because yeah. otherwise, they think it's something they have to hide, and it builds an emotional barrier between you and you. Know they're thinking about about their family, and so just embrace that. 
and, and support that and um, and just do the best you can because um, here's one of the, the real hard thing for us and, and that's who are you feeling pressure to please this holiday season because we all are. So if you want to just um, in that chat window there, think about who you might be feeling pressure to please this holiday season. Just um, be vulnerable, be bold, just say my mom, my dad, my parents, my grandma, whatever. But if you feel like uh, you're okay with sharing that, we would love to hear who you feel a pressure to please at this holiday season um, because we're going to talk about who we felt the pressure to please for the longest time. And drum roll, please. It is our parents. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah, we, so Ryan and I, we both came from very different Christmas traditions. And so at Christmas time, um, my family had a Christmas Eve tradition. We would have, uh, my mom made this cheesy potato soup for dinner. And then we would all go to a Christmas Eve service at church and then on Christmas morning, we would open Christmas presents together as a family um, and then play with our toys during the day, right? Everybody would kind of play. So then when we became adults, that was my expectation of what Christmas looked like. It was also my parents' expectation. And they even wanted us to still like come to their house on Christmas morning in our pajamas because they only live like 20 minutes away. And so it wasn't like we were spending the night at their house because we had traveled. So they wanted us to just come in our pajamas. They wanted us to come over on Christmas Eve and have dinner with them. And, and Ryan's family had different traditions. Yes. Yeah, so um, my family, uh, we didn't do Christmas Eve um, church service. Um, that's not a typical um, thing to do uh, where I'm from in South Africa. I think probably only uh, folks in the Anglic in the in the Catholic tradition whether it be Roman or, or Anglo uh, Catholic or, or, or Eastern Orthodox you know those types of churches and more liturgical uh, churches they would have mass on Christmas Eve but but your normal typical evangelical churches did not so I did not grow up with that so what we used to do uh, we would go to um, my grandma's house and she would make the same kind of food. Uh, every time we'd play board games and then at midnight we would um, we would open gifts we'd all step till midnight we'd open gifts and then go to bed and then sleep at grandma's house and the next morning um, we would um, get up play Christmas um, with our toys and then have Christmas lunch together at grandma's house and so when we got married uh, before we had children this is kind of how we used to do Christmas. Now, if I forget anything, <laughs> uh, just um, kick me under the table or just jump right in. So uh, we would start Christmas Eve. We'd go over at lunchtime to my in-laws house. We'd have um, sort of the late afternoon um, soup. From there, we'd go to church where my parents would meet us at church. So both sides of the family at the church service. From there, we would go over to my parents' house and have like a Christmas Eve party. Um, wake up uh, and do gifts at midnight. Then we'd go home, do gifts together um, in the morning. From that, go over to her parents' house, do gifts with them. Then go back home, get changed, and get ready. Go to my parents' house from, for lunch. From there, go to my in-laws for dinner, and then go home and hate Christmas. <laughs> yep, and, that's about everything. <laughs> and then when we sort of have it, you know, at first before we kind of got those under control of those things, uh, we would also, um, you know, once we had kids, we would do Christmas morning at home with the presents we got our kids in the midst of all of that. So, uh, how, how about you, Chris? Um, did, did you guys, when you got married, have some crazy Christmas traditions? It was pretty much just the back and forth travel, kind of like what you. Uh, you just alluded to, you know, I grew up in Baton Rouge and Kelly grew up in New Orleans. So, you know, they're only 60 miles apart. Um, and so, yeah, we would, uh, I guess a lot of it depending upon where my parents were spending Christmas, uh, because sometimes it was with uh, my dad's parents in Baton Rouge and sometimes it was, it was with my mom's parents in Mississippi. And so if they were going to Mississippi, then we usually did stuff with them on Christmas Eve and, uh, or even the 23rd. And then, but usually, if it was, you know, a Baton Rouge Christmas, um, we would just kind of tend to flip-flop things. Like, we, you know, we, we'd get up Christmas morning, we'd drive up there, uh, do gifts with the extended family, 
uh, have lunch. And then after lunch, we drive back down to New Orleans, do gifts with the extended family on Kelly's side and have dinner. And then, you know, the next year we might flip flop it kind of a thing. So. But trying to please everybody, trying to be all things to all people. Right. right? Which wasn't that bad when it was just the two of us. Yeah. Right. It's just. You add kids into the mix. Yeah. Kids in the mix. Things changed a lot. Yeah. But. Uh, well, and, and the problem with all of that is when you, it's not just when you add kids and you add kids with trauma histories into the mix. Yeah. That's just, you, you, you're just setting them up for failure because you're creating complete chaos yeah. you know just complete chaos um which which is unnerving and unsettling and they don't feel safe when they don't feel safe they try to control the situation and when they try to control the situation um you get into a control battle with them and then ain't nobody happy right we're throwing sugar and staying up to <laughs> because we think about this we're opening gifts at midnight I and mean, we finally got my folks to agree that we could open gifts at 10 o'clock for the kiddos and so um you know there was there was all of that the up and down driving um did i miss anything i feel like i missed something <laughs> no it was, it was pretty complicated so we have several people on the chat saying that they feel a lot of pressure to um please their kids particularly adult kids and um biological kids whose world has been kind of mm. rocked by christmas this year i think that's a that's an interesting perspective i don't know that i've had that experience um mm. I mean, we don't have any adult children that we're trying to please um, we had foster and adopted kids before we had any biological kids. So it's always been kind of um, the same for us at Christmas, but um, definitely the pressure to make sure the kids have a fun Christmas. So right. they said, you know, they, they, they want to make sure, do they get the right gifts? Did, are the kids happy? I remember um, we had one child in particular who really struggled with receiving gifts mm. and so I would try so hard and I'd like go out and find the perfect thing. I'd like make sure that I asked this child and I was sure that I was sure that I was sure that I got the thing they wanted and they'd open it up and go, this isn't really what I wanted. And I would get so frustrated and I was just like, girl, why? I know that you said you wanted it like 20 times and I got this. You even circled it in the catalog. Yeah. I mean, I felt like I had done a really good job. And so, yeah, I mean, pressure to make sure your kids have a good holiday and as the kids get older and maybe move out on their own and they're dealing with their own set of pressures as well so yeah and i think this you know we're talking about having our folks close by um i don't know how, baton rouge new orleans is not super far is it 60 miles okay so um the it's even more pressure when you're seeing the family twice a year and one of those times is christmas you, yeah. know, you got to travel or grandma and grandpa are coming in because because right. then the kids are getting the you better act right sermons and all those kinds of things <laughs> and, uh, and and you know and, and i think that um i mean i think we just have to be you know the part of what attachment research tells us is that is that the adults have to be free from the past in order to be fully present for the kids and be the kind of parents um, that the kids need and so that christmas is a great example of that because um if you're still sort of entangled back there and pleasing your mom and your dad not saying you should try to offend your mom and dad right what i'm saying is that you should have a good relationship with your mom and dad and constantly trying to please them is not an indicator of a healthy relationship with them yeah. so if you're constantly trying to please your mom and dad you put so much pressure on your kids because you want them to act right you want them to please because because your kids are a reflection of you and we need to just sort of uh, all agree right now we're just going to let that go and say, no, my kids are my responsibility to love well and to parent well and to, and to help them work through their histories. But if we don't work through um, our histories, um, then we really can't help the kids work through their histories. And so uh, the pressure really is on if you only seen grandma twice a year. Um, you know, there's something that, that, that I know that we, a lot of us perhaps didn't think about, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, growing up. But if uh, some of you, um, and you can just, you know, same here if you agree with this but or if you heard this growing up uh, if you're crying and you went to your parent um, for comfort and um, instead of providing nurturing care they said if you don't stop crying i'll give you something to cry about <laughs> so if you heard that phrase growing up just um, say same here or or whatever in the chat there because um, a lot of us did hear that, you know, if you don't stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. The problem with that is that your child has identified you as their protector 
and their source of comfort, and then they have come, come to you when they're struggling, and so um, you have now become a source of terror for them. Right. And the same thing happens at Christmas when we decide that, that, that pleasing our parents and our grandparents and whoever else is more important than having a healthy, nurturing relationship with our children. I think we focus on the long, the long thing. I, I think that, that we did that, um, you know, growing in, in our early on in our parenting uh, was we focused on the wrong thing because we have been given the responsibility to help our children heal from relational trauma. And so we, as part of that responsibility, we have to look in our own histories and say, what's key, keeping me from moving on? Because I will tell you when Kayla and I told our parents, um, you know, we restructured uh, Christmas time and, and now it's a much simpler flow. It includes a very peaceful morning at home with our children. Uh, the evening's a lot less complicated. Um, the year we told them that was hard. And it was not hard for any reason other than we thought that they would not be happy with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was hard. And then the second year, it was like, y'all weren't serious about last year, were you? And we're like, no, yeah, we were. And then year three, four, and five now uh, have been a lot, a lot easier to do. But it was not hard because what, what was about to come out of my mouth was going to make Christmas easier and more pleasant for my children. It's, I was, concerned that our, we were concerned that our parents would not be pleased with us right and that's really was a double eye opener for us because we figured well, that's when we really understood that a lot of what we were doing uh, or surrounding christmas wasn't about peace on earth and good will to men it was about making our parents um parents happy so um, the next thing we want to talk about is um is this what about expectations so kayla what about expectations well I mean, we all, like we kind of talked about a little bit already, we have expectations of what the holidays are going to look like. Our kids have expectations of what's going to happen. Maybe they're talking to their friends and Santa brings their friends an Xbox every year. And at your house, Santa brings uh, a dolly, wow, you know, Xbox right? Every year. <laughs> you know what I mean? The kids kind of compare those things. And so maybe they have these expectations or maybe they have um, expectations because this is their first year in your home and you don't even know what those expectations are yet. Yeah. You, I mean, you literally have no idea what Christmas has been like for them in the past. Yeah. Um, maybe their expectation is that Christmas is going to be horrible and that, you know, they're surprised if Santa comes to their house or mm. maybe they have expectations that, you know, now that they're in your home, things are going to look a certain way because somebody told them that. Um, and so, we don't know what expectations are out there all the time. And a lot of times that's where, that's where problems start, right? Is unmet, unmet expectations. Um, and so when our children um, or, or we don't get our expectations met, then we begin to have conflict, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of things to remember about expectations. Uh, and that's one thing is that we need to be filled with grace. Um, because there are people um, who don't get it. And some of those people who don't get it, we call them mom and dad, mm -hmm. you know, and grandma and grandpa, because, you know. Or um, our, our siblings who have their own children or have uh, in-laws with in -laws or, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's all those people that are all the extended family that we see or the cousin that you see once a year at Christmas, right? Yeah. So um, when you said extended family, it made me think of a scene in Instant Family. <laughs> uh, which um spoiler alert well no, it's, it's, it's it's not a big deal except that um her sister sister well when we have children they'll be perfectly behaved <laughs> not like your children <laughs> or some yeah. version thereof yeah. so so there is that um there there is that um you know so we have to be filled with grace because i think some of the assumptions so let's just be honest we go in with our guard up it's not like we're going into christmas going oh we're just going to enjoy the time of the family we go in assuming that that people are going to um, are going to be assuming things about our kids, saying things about our kids, judging, judging, our, judging kids. our kids, yeah. or judging uh, our parenting. Yes. The, uh, and, and so you know, which is really what we're really afraid about, right? For we're afraid of being yeah. judged as parents because everybody needs to have a good parents, right? Correct. Even though we may or may not be, but what's important here to be filled with grace. Thing um, we have a friend who, who told us uh, one time that. Um, when they were fostering, um, his parents 
support different kids gifts for the um for the kids versus um their kids versus their foster kids Ugh. um and and i know that was hard for him and we've spoken about it and, and that was hard for us because because I, I felt like that happened sometimes too i'm not sure if it actually happened but i feel like it did um but but one of the things that was really liberating for Kayla and I in, as being filled with grace and really kind of having grace for the people in our story is that um, it didn't occur to us until we'd been parenting for, you know, about five or six years that our parents in their dreams of becoming grandparents did not go, you know what, I hope I become a grandparent by it because my kids will foster one day. Right. And I think that we put a lot of pressure on our parents and we... Um, we make a lot of assumptions and we interact with them in different ways because of that. And, and I know some people listening to me right now went, oh gosh, that's harsh. But the truth of the matter is, um, while we're foster parents and we want the whole family to do it, and I think we're in a much better place with our parents now than we yeah. were five, six years ago. Um, the truth of the matter is, is they don't view that as being a foster grandparent. They view that as being a temporary grandparent, mm. which, which we have to understand. Because if we don't understand that and grasp that truth, it's going to be really, really hard to be filled with grace. Do you yeah. want to add anything to that? No, that's good. Okay. Um, and the second thing we have to remember, uh, remember is we need to gently educate others. Yeah. And I've got, a, um, I've got a resource that we'll share with you guys that is just a few things that we may want to, you may want to touch on with grandparents, aunts and uncles, especially people who don't see your kids regularly that you're going to see during the holiday season, right? because they may not have any idea of the different style of parenting that you're having to use. The connected parenting idea may be completely foreign to them and they just assume that your kids are going to do the same things their kids are. Right. And then they may just assume your kids are bratty when they melt down if they've planned like 5,000 activities and given them red food diet all day long, right? <laughs> I mean, it just, if we can educate people, especially giving them a little bit of advanced education um, before we come saying, hey, you know, here's some things about my kids that you might want to know. Here are some areas. So I put together a little resource that hopefully will be helpful in um, either just sending and saying, hey, here's this, you know, one big happy home. They have a lot of resources. You might want to check it out before we come. Here's a resource, you know, or you can use it as you're wanting to educate the family. Yes. Yeah. It's one of those things it goes back to what we we're talking about with managing expectations. Yeah. Because, you know, for our family, we were not a, fo we were not a foster family. Uh, Kelly and I, we were straight up adoptions with, with two of our three kids. And we had one, we were there when Samuel was born. We were in the delivery room. Yeah. Uh, his second day uh, out of the womb, he went home with us. And then with Nathaniel, he was only eight months old when we met him in person. Yeah. And so I think for our extended family, there was an expectation of, oh, you've had them since they were born or almost right. since they were born, you know. And as they, it was when they got older. And they so didn't expect the, there would be any problems. Right. Right. And then, so there was the education, not only for ourselves, but for our extended family that we had to do that just because, you know, they've been with us since the beginning or almost the beginning of their lives doesn't mean that there aren't uh, issues that we're going to have to work through that we didn't have to work through with our biological kid. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And um, I want to focus on the word gently there before we move on, because I think sometimes we think it's okay to be, um, smart mouthy <laughs> and and uh, and uh, what's not really that biting because there's some anger behind it um but i think it's always okay um and you know you know we're, we're talking about dealing with conflict in, in church right now and, and i think it's okay to um to take a deep breath and to carefully choose your words mm. conflict's going to happen uh, sadly we know conflict happens um at <laughs> this time of the year uh, avoiding conflict is neither biblical nor helpful but engaging conflict in respectful ways is because, you know, we've lost the art of disagreement. Right. Let's bring it back this Christmas. That's what I want for Christmas, the return of the lost art of disagreement. Yeah. <laughs> and if sarcasm is your love language, as it is mine, <laughs> try to table that and put it on the back burner when you're having these discussions. <laughs> that is good and wise advice. And then, and this is super important. At the end of the day, um, the children are a blessing from the Lord. Yeah. And it's our responsibility to protect them. 
um, you know, and, and, and a couple of examples of that. I don't know if you, if you guys want to share anything, but, um, you know, I have an uncle who, um, who, who is difficult relationally. And so, um, you know, there were some things that happened in my childhood that he was involved in that were difficult. Um, and not anything like for those of you who thought like, like really bad and criminal, nothing like that, but just, he was just a difficult guy to be around. And, and when we became parents, um, I, you know, we consciously chose to disengage that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's been some time, you know, we're going to go celebrate Thanksgiving with him and his family this year. It's the first time my kids will be going out there. Um, but we've had to, as a term to sort of protect our kids, uh, had to, um, had to not engage, um, that relationship, um, the way it was engaged before we had children. And so, you know, um, I'm not telling you that's completely right, but what I'm telling you is that we chose to protect our children. Right. And now and then they're sort of at ages where we feel like um, they can handle it and he's getting older and, and mellowing, but you know, let's bring it even closer to home. There's been a Thanksgiving um, at, with, with my parents where at some point Kayla heard me said, Kayla, get the children. We're leaving mm. um, because it just got a little out of, out of hand and it ended up with, with my dad driving out of our house uh, hours later that evening. So he could apologize to Kayla face to face for his conduct. Um, and, and when he left, I said, you know, you know what, never mind what I said. <laughs> when he left. Um, but, but you know, um, we've had to do that. And I think that was, that was hard to do, but I think it was a, a moment where he sort of um, ultimately ended up respecting us as parents because um, we said, we're not going to do this today. Yeah. And it's not good for our kids. And so, you know, um, if you're all going to do things like that, you have to consider that at some point it's going to be difficult. Uh, and at some point you're going to have to make that relationship right. So don't just sort of dive in on that, but think it through and have a plan that you can gracefully bow out if things are getting to a place um, where you don't want them to be. Yeah. All right. And so just remember this, more stuff does not mean more <laughs> happiness. <laughs> simplify, simplify, simplify. So Kayla's going to talk about this a little, a little bit more, uh, but the reason that more stuff does not mean more happiness, because if we're looking at Christmas specifically, and it's peace on earth and goodwill to all men, it is really sadly ironic that a lot of homes um, that, we, that we move in and hear about, it's not peace on earth and goodwill to all men. No. And also, you know, the Thanksgiving coming up here in the States in a couple of days, the attitude of gratitude that comes along with the holiday. We don't find that a lot in some of the homes that. Yeah, because it's a war zone. In. Right. It's a war zone. And so we don't want that. Um, so let's get practical because um, we can talk all night. And trust me, folks, we can't talk all night. Um, those of you who know us personally are actually laughing right now. Russ Hyken. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So let's get practical. So the first piece of advice we have is keep it uh, simple. And the first place we want to apply that is to gift giving. Yeah. So obviously we've got Thanksgiving coming up, but Christmas, um, we can tend to go overboard, I think, with our kids. And we, a lot of times we want to make it wonderful, right? We have that, that need, that we have a need to please our kids and we want our kids to have a great um, Christmas was something we did several years ago. Gosh, I don't even remember when we started it. Probably, probably six or seven years ago. I mean, it's been a while. Um, is we we adopted the um, our kids get four gifts at Christmas: something they want, something they need, something to wear, and something to read. And the kids will actually give us a, a Christmas gift list with those categories. Well, I want this for my want and this for my need and this, and it's been so simplified. Now we have six kids. And so that's still 24 presents for the mm -hmm. kids. Right. And then Santa always brings a family gift. So it's something that the whole family can enjoy. One year it was a trip to SeaWorld. Um, other years it's been, you know, just a, a family game night box with a couple of games and some movies and, um, you know, favorite drinks and popcorn and things like that. Right. But we've tried to simplify it. So our kids know they're going to get four gifts. Yeah. So that takes a little bit of the, I wonder if I'm going to get this. I wonder mm. if I'm going to get that. They also know that we have a limit to how much we're going to spend. So they'll tell us they want something and we'll go, that's outside of the budget of what we spend for Christmas. Yeah. And so we've given them kind of an idea. So they're not 
some of our kids like have that wonder, like, oh my gosh, are they going to get me that, you know, whatever? I don't even know. What Super Malibu list. Barbie Dream House. There you go. And and we can. It's odd that you said that first. That is funny because you don't have any girls. <laughs> But you do. That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, I was wondering why you think about Super Malibu Dream House. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, no, but I, I think giving our kids, it keeps it simple for us. And it also, for our kids, they're not wondering, you know, what's coming at Christmas. Like, they have an idea of about how much we spend for Christmas. Yeah. And they know that it's not going to exceed that, right? Well, and you're so, setting an expectation ahead of time. Exactly. To minimize possible disappointment. Exactly. Yeah. So they're not wondering, are they going to get this $400 thing? No, sorry, no. we don't spend that much at Christmas. <laughs> and so just in the, in the realm of gift giving, I would say simplify yeah. as much as you can and set proper expectations for your kids so that they're not, um, you know, first wanting everything they see, but also they're like, oh, well, I really want this and I want this. And you're like, well, look, we, you know, in our family, we get four gifts. And so they're like, well, I think I want this one. And my kids have actually like, no, 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 don't give me that. Instead, I want this. And because they come up with what they really, really want yeah. in that case. So it's been great for our family. Well, the other thing I like about it is um, over the years, the whole more, 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 me, 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 me thing. Um, has sort of gone away a little bit in our home. Yeah. Um, it's not just like more, 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 because before we were on this plan, um, we would set a budget and then we would try to buy as many things within that budget. Within and, the budget, yeah. And then, and then um, we'd go to to my parents' side of the family. We used to take all the kids, uh, we used to take the kids' toys with us um, there because um, some of the, like half of the toys there with us and half of the toys were with our my in-laws when we when we used to do that that rodeo and so we'd have toys for the kids my parents would have toys for the kids my siblings would have toys for the so kids my aunts, and it was like yeah. all these people and each of the kids had like 10 gifts they were opening and they would and they'd get a gift that rip the paper off and go whoa nice next mm. and i'm like what are we teaching our children and so you know the gifts tend to have more meaning for them um and and so we really like that um, keeping it simple when it comes to gift giving. Also, it does remove some of the stress um, from the parents yeah. for the gift buying. So um, the next thing um, is activities. I think this time of year we can be tempted to have all the activities, right? We can want to go and wait in the like five mile line, five mile long line. That's hard to say mm. to sit in Santa's lap. Yeah, which our kids hate and they mm. scream and they think it's dumb or they cry. Right. And we're like, but we need to do it. It's a tradition. It's mm. something we must do. Right. Um, How about Christmas lights? Oh, we want to go look at Christmas lights. Now some of our kids can do well with that. Some yeah. of our kids, My love, kids love Christmas. lights. Yeah. But if it's not something that your family really enjoys and that can actually be a fun time don't do it just to do it mm -hmm. right there's so many activities there's so many opportunities for activities and we have you know we're going to give you a you know 12 days of connection and a lot of those are different activities that you can do but don't use it as a oh my gosh we have to do these 12 more things right because i think that when we try and add in more and more and more and more and more we lose connection with our kids yeah. and we, we lose the specialness of being together and having that family time. And so we don't, more activities is not better. Keep those activities simple. Do the things your family really truly loves and get rid of the rest. Say no to the cookie party that you really don't need 4,000 more cookies at your house, yeah. right? Or, or go to it, but don't take cookies, you mm -hmm. know, or, um, say no to the, you know, we're going to make ornaments together as a group because you can't just do everything. There's been, I think in the past, I have been really tempted to um, just simply want to do all the Christmassy things that I could, but pick and choose the things you can do as a family, pick and choose the things you do as individuals, you know, work Christmas parties and friend Christmas parties and Friendsgiving and Thanksgiving and all these different things, right? Just kind of simplify yeah. when it comes to the activities. They're always going to call her out for saying Friendsgiving. What? <laughs> people do that. That's it's a fine. thing. People do that. Yeah. 
Sorry. We get invited every year. But so we Dallas say no. and I had a conversation about it earlier, so that's probably <laughs> should have let that be a sidebar. Um, you know, the activities, the, the Christmas light thing was cracks me up because, um, you know, getting our children out of the door in summer when all they have to do is find flip-flops before they walk out the door is a 30-minute <laughs> exercise. Now they've got to find boots and jackets and scarves Coats. and gloves and hats. Yeah. And by the time we get in the car to go, um, to go uh, Christmas light looking, it's past dinner time. And we <laughs> have planned to be back. And then we got to stop and buy food because they complain all they're hangry. They complain all the way. Then I complain all the way. And then we get You're home hangry. four hours later. And I once again hate Christmas. You know what I mean? And it's just, um, it, we just really have to simplify uh, all of those things for our kiddos. Um, and then uh, the extended, oh, one more thing about the activities. Um, something that, that Kayla's parents have gotten good at over the years is um, they've, they've taken to moving from buying things as gifts to buying experiences as gifts. Yeah. And so, you know, one year they got our, our family um, like season passes to the water park. Um, they, you know, my, my son turned 16 and they, 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 for his birthday, they got him, uh, they're taking him to, um, so I won't mention the name, but it's a place where you play golf in like in three stories and hit it into the yes. top golf. So, <laughs> um, yeah, they're taking him there. And I think that's really, really great because they're, they're, this relationship focused, um, it's building memory focused. Yeah. Too, right. Yeah. yeah. So instead of the stuff that they're just next and then, uh, extended family time. Kelly, got anything there for us? No, I mean, I think just, just what we talked about earlier, like thinking about how much time you're spending with extended family and making the most of that time. Um, spending time with that extended family is important, but what can your kids handle? How much can you yeah. handle? How much can your kids handle? Um, and keep it, keep it long enough that you can enjoy it, but not so long that your kids melt down and all everybody remembers is the kids melting down because yeah. they were there too long. Be really intentional about planning. Be very it out. intentional. Yes. Yeah. Because I think sometimes we kind of go, Oh, everybody's doing great. We're just going to stay 30 more minutes and that 30 more minutes. That's when it, I will stay. Is the up yeah. yeah. If that's they're happy meltdown. when you leave, you stay too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a rule of thumb. Somebody tweet that if you're happy, if they're happy when you leave, you oh, if the right. family's happy, happy when you, you leave. Yes, with your grandma and grandpa happy. happy. I thought you meant if the kids were happy when you leave. I'm like, no, no, you want your kids to be happy when you leave. Okay, and then the next piece of practical advice we have is, is don't lose perspective. And so um, let's, let's not lose perspective that our children come from trauma histories, um, in, uh, um, physical abuse, emotional neglect, and things of that nature. And so um, that did impact their brain. And we cannot forget that those brains are still developing. Those brains are still healing but their brains are impacted. And if they did not come from a place where their needs were met as children, where that healthy attachment dance uh, didn't happen, um, then, um, you know, they're just not going to be wired for empathy. They're not really going to be concerned. Not that they're not concerned how their actions impact other people. It's they don't have the ability to be concerned. Right. And I think we forget that sometimes. And we think that a lot of the behaviors we see is willful. Um, but let's keep perspective like the slide says. It's not willful it is them doing exactly what they're able to do and the only way you, you get them past that is to love them um you know i said this at tapestry conference this year uh, being hard, tough on a hard kid will make them harder they will not make them any kinder yeah and a lot of times it's, it's just a defense mechanism yeah i mean right. it's, it's chaos right have you ever taken one of your adopted to a foster kids to chuck e cheese it doesn't go well all the time no. right well, Christmas in the time? Christmas Does it in ever? A, well, Christmas in a big family is like having Chuck E. Cheese at the house. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you just got to be mindful of that and think about how that, that situation is stressing them. And, and they are going to that place in their brain where they are going to protect themselves and, and they will lash out. And, and you just got to remember that trauma has had an impact on your child's brain. And, and, and at Christmas, um, it, rare, it rears its ugly head more than it might the rest of the year. Yeah. Um, you know, their birthdays, the date they came into care, things like that. But um, it has had an impact on their brain. And because it's impacted their brain, their behaviors are impacted, their beliefs are impacted. Um, you know. And keeping that perspective and recognizing if you have a kid that has sensory issues, has sensory needs, then you have to make sure that you're, you come prepared 
with those sensory needs, yeah. uh, something. So maybe you bring the noise canceling headphones. Maybe you bring the weighted blanket with you when you go visit relatives, right? Maybe you prepare in advance when you get there, a, a quiet place for that child to go. Yeah. You make sure you have the, the snacks that you need so that your child can stay, um, well fed because they're going to sneak all the Christmas cookies they can possibly have. <laughs> and Hershey so, kisses. Exactly. And whatever's and, out. And, yeah. But make sure that you're giving them some of that healthy, you know, that protein snack every two hours. Set your alarm still. So be proactive as you remember that their brain has been wired differently. Yeah. Russ says sneak a snuggle break with mom. Love it. Yes. Um, and then here's another question. Are our traditions worth the stress? So uh, Kayla has a great story about that. Yeah, we, um, so growing up, my parents had a, you know, those little M&M guys you see, they come out at Christmas time and you pull their hand uh -huh. and they shoot out M&Ms. Right. Yeah. So that was a tradition in my family. My mom would pull that out um, and she would fill it up with M&Ms and we'd come by and we'd get our little M handful of M&Ms and it was all wonderful and great. And so one year my parents got us the first year, probably we had kids. Yeah. Ooh, they I got think us. We got married for maybe, our, yeah, yeah, maybe for our first Christmas together, they got us our very own M and M guy. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, this Hate is so guy. fun!" <laughs> <laughs> and Not the, at first, I enjoyed him at first. We love yes. hate. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Uh -huh. So, so we pulled out this M and M guy, and we would use it when we didn't have any children, and we thought it was fun. I would buy a bag of M and Ms. Can I just say right now that I'm a real M and M crazy? Oh Let's yeah, talk <laughs> just talking about it. And then one of our children arrived in our family and you might as well, he, he, this child might as well have taken his mouth and put it underneath the spout and just poured the entire bag of M&Ms into his mouth mm. because that is what happened. May have means did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is what happens. And, and we would empty that thing so fast. And while it was a fun tradition, it is not a tradition that my kids could handle. Yeah. Now, one day they may be able to handle it a little better they're not there yet, right? They can't handle the constant flow of candy in our house. Yeah. So it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth the stress. It was something fun from my childhood that I could not bring to my kids. So that little m, &M guy, while we haven't gotten rid of him, he stays in the box with the Christmas stuff. He loves it. He lives up in the attic with Santa the and the rest of the elves. Yes. <laughs> and it's important to remember that even good things can be bad, right? Um, you know, um, if you're taking the kids, um, you know, to to serve, um, to serve lunch on Thanksgiving Day, to to shut-ins, or mm. or at the at the at the food um, shelf at the homeless shelter or yeah. something like that, um, that can be overwhelming uh, for the children. And so, while that is a good thing, absolutely, we certainly want to uh, make sure that, that we're not um, overwhelming the kids because um, we're trying to um, do good things. Because, you know, our kids are our responsibility. And, and I know, because we've done this on Thanksgiving, uh, some of these places, there's a line of people. I mean, they, we went one Thanksgiving and they turned people away from the food line um, because there were so many people. So if we have to take a break this Thanksgiving and next... So many people like, volunteering. Volunteering, that's what yeah, I mean. So, yeah, they didn't turn people away for food, but it was the volunteers. They turned volunteers away. Cause they didn't have anything for them to do, yeah. but we, um, and we used to do this. We used to go on Thanksgiving and every Thanksgiving we would go and serve, um, meals. And this, we did this when we had our, the first three kids in our home, we did this. And then we started adding more children to our home and it wasn't the number of children. It was the particular children mm -hmm. that couldn't handle it. Yeah. And we tried it one year and we were like, wow, we really should have rethought this. So you have to know your kids yeah. and what they can handle. And maybe there's one particular kiddo that can't handle doing stuff like that. So you find other ways to do it with the other children who can handle it. You can go all year long and serve soup at a soup kitchen. Yeah. You can and they'd all... rather you come other than Thanksgiving, exactly. Christmas. That's when everyone wants exactly. to come. Exactly. And so yeah. you can find other ways to help. We're not saying don't do these wonderful things, but just knowing that those things can be triggers for our kids. Yeah. I mean, some of our kids may have spent time in a shelter. Right. And that brings back That's memories of, of being in the shelter, right? Um, and so we just want to make sure that even those good things, Advent readings, right? Trying to, 
we've tried to do those little Christmas trees where we hang the ornaments all the time. And some years it's gone really well. And other years I'm like screaming at the children to sit down so they can listen to the Advent story. <laughs> and then I'm like, sit down, and shut up. Let's listen to our <laughs> yeah, peace on earth. <laughs> it's not really exactly what I had pictured in my mind. So even those yeah. good things can, can become bad if we don't keep our perspective. Well, and then those little books with little um, Advent windows and the kids pop them open, there's a little chocolate behind it. Oh. Yeah. Those mother, are all gone the first day. Yeah, my mother loves yeah. you. That, they just like to eat 25 chocolates. In right. That's exactly day. right. And I'd rather they do that because they just drive me crazy anyways. <laughs> the children or the Advent books? <laughs> Both. Ad, the Advent <laughs> calendars with the chocolates. They do. They do. They're they not do. even that great chocolate. Anyways. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyhow. Um, so yeah, that, you know, even good things can be bad, and I think that's important to remember because, for our kids with trauma histories, what we know is that good stress and bad stress is both processed as bad stress. Yep. They can't handle it, right? Right. And so we want to be mindful of that. Um, and then last year to close it before we we get here to us uh, in Q and A, um, and that's we need to stay connected. We need to stay connected to our kids. So we have to ask rela relationship first questions. Um, what can I do to build a better relationship here? What can I build a stronger relationship here? Because if your kids grow up hating Christmas, um, you, you missed the point entirely. Yeah. And a lot of us, um, you know, have baggage from Christmas because it was all the for the family activity was forced. Okay, I'm going to try it again. I have baggage from Christmas because <laughs> a lot of the family the activities were forced in, and I, and I w w felt like I was made to participate in them. And Christmas for me, um, you know, it's gotten better over the years, but it's gotten better over the years, the last few years, since we've sort of made it our own and made sense yeah. of it. Um, so we need to make sure that we're raising the kind of kids who um, who are having good Christmas experiences and not, and not dreading them. Because Kayla and I tell people all the time, our, our test of, of, of how you did relationally with your children is when they leave your home, will they choose to celebrate Christmas in yours? Because we went with it as adults with their own families. Because I don't want my children to come and celebrate Christmas with us out of a sense of obligation, yeah. like we did for many years. I want my children to come and celebrate Christmas with us because they, they they have a good relationship with us, they trust us, and they want to be around us, and they want their kids to know their grandparents. Yeah, yeah. And then the second thing, obviously, is we want to stay connected uh, to to Jesus in all of this. Sometimes we lose focus this time of year right the commercialization yeah everything the whole and focus the, of the holiday we lose sight of right yeah. and so i think as we stay connected to our kids as we stay connected to jesus as we we pray for our kids through this time we pray for our own hearts and our own attitudes and our own baggage to just kind of be brought to the light so that we can deal with it right yeah. to be um to not be a stumbling to our relationship with our kids um, and as we just focus on our relationship with Jesus, we're going to have better relationships with our kids, with our extended family, with our spouse. I mean, all of that's going to fall into place. You know, th you know, while you were talking, I was thinking that when Jesus had concern for his uh, disciples, uh, he went in the garden and he prayed for them. And um, when we have concern about our children or our relationships with extended family, or we... Um, going and praying about that or are we calling our friends and meeting at starbucks and gossiping about that because i suspect the second thing i said uh, is more um is more likely so um at the end of all of this guys um building healthy relationships with our children is the only way they're going to heal from the relational trauma and so we have to have this time to be a time of staying connected to our kids and if we can keep that as the number one thing um, then a lot of the rest of this is going to fall into place. So um, if you have any questions, um, you're going to type them into the, that, that question field, or if you guys have scanned those um, and want to uh, share some of them. Also, um, you know, what's, if you can just share in there, if you don't have a question, just as we're wrapping up here, if you can maybe share um, something that's just really, really important to you uh, this time of the year. Um, for me, um, it is uh, Christmas morning with Kayla and the kids. It's just, it's a very special time for me. There's a lot of joy in our home. Uh, there's a lot of peace in our home. We have breakfast together. We open gifts and then we just kind of take, take the morning off because we're not going over to her folks until dinner, before dinner time that night. So um, 
Christmas morning is just super special to me. So um, if there's anything uh, that's super special to you guys there, or if you have any questions, um, you can type them in there. Um, while we're doing that, again, just want to remind you guys um, of some ways to get hold of us here um, as we develop resources, and we'll have more of these in 2019. And, and how we're going to do webinars in 2019, we're going to we're going to take episodes of the podcast, um, which are around 20 or 22 minutes long, and then you know go a little bit deeper on those and dive deeper and uh, do like an hour long webinar uh, on some of the, the the episodes. We get requests for going deeper on the episodes. This is one of them. That's why we put this together. And so your feedback um, is uh, is very important to us. So some questions here, guys. Yeah, we have one that says, uh, if we need to change a tradition or we need to skip an extended family activity because one of our kids can't handle it, how do we keep the other children from resenting that sibling? Mm, Great question. question. Yeah. Great question. I think um, as we talk to our kids, one of the biggest things that we have to help our kids understand is that we parent our kids based on their needs. Um, and we have to look at every kid's needs. We can't just look at one kid's needs and we can't just look at, well, it would be really fun for this one, one kid. And so as we um, prepare our kids, I think preparing them in advance, hey, we're going to do things a little differently this year. You don't necessarily have to blame it on one child and say, well, you know, your sister can't handle this. So yeah. we're going to do it this way this year. But instead say, hey, we're going to try something new this year. Mm. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go, um, we're going to skip this one activity, but instead we're going to do um, this as a family. Yeah. So um, I think you can, you can word it in a way that it doesn't necessarily cast blame. Now our kids are smart and they're going to pick up yeah. on, you know, well, every year, you know, Johnny melts down when we go look at Christmas lights. So this year we don't get to look at Christmas lights or, yeah. you know, and so, um, but we can also do things with individual kids. I was just going to say, it might be a divide and conquer thing that you it can do It might be a divide too. and conquer, yeah. or it might be a, you know, this would be a great activity to do with a, an aunt or an uncle, or this mm -hmm. would be something grandma can take you to go do this one thing. The whole family's not going to do it, but we're going to let you do it because it's special for you, but it's not special for everybody necessarily. Yeah. So I think you can... Um, I think you can do it in a way that doesn't necessarily lay blame on one so that there doesn't have that resentment build up. Yeah. Okay, so we also have, uh, now that some of your kids are older, how do they prepare themselves for the holidays or ask for your support or do they ask at all? Um, okay, so I, I was reading that question while you were answering the other one, Kayla. And um, I think one of the things that, that I'm pleased about what we've done in our parenting um, is we've made a really strong effort to help connect our children to their feelings yeah. and help our children express their feelings. And whether that be mom and dad at home, whether that be um, you know, asking extended family members to kind of speak into that, whether that's being going to therapist. Um, so we've really helped our kids connect to their feelings. And now that they're older, um, they don't really ask for our support per se, but they do really talk, they do talk more about what they're experiencing. Yeah. And that pleases us. So I think the real answer there is, is if you will just do the hard work, because sometimes we don't want to hear about what our kids are feeling. And sometimes it's hard. Yeah. So by hard work, I mean, you have to invite them into that. You have to create a safe place for them to do that. And the way that you do the safe place is that if you grew up in a conservative Christian home and you've adopted kids from trauma, you might hear some stuff that you did not think you were going to hear right. from your children. And you have to find a way to, um, to, to not let your face betray that that was hard and, and really, you know, be understanding and open to their feelings because, because there's a lot going up there cognitively from the miswiring of, of their brains. And, 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 and a lot of what's happening is, is not intentional and we have to remember that and we have to help them. So I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, Rebecca and I think that if we will just kind of help our kids connect to their feelings and bring those feelings from uh, way down in the recesses of their brain up to you know the front of the prefrontal cortex right at the front of your brain where logic and language live and that's how we help them process yeah well, and I think also um, not just in the emotions and the feelings part of it too when we're thinking about like sensory overload and how our kids um, maybe you know we have one of ours who absolutely 
can't stand like all the people chewing and like sneezing and all the noises that people make. And so this particular child carries um, noise canceling headphones around and has them. And we don't have to remind her to do that. She just does it now. Yeah. When she was younger, we had to make sure we brought them with, but now she keeps them with her. Um, we have another one who um, really needs that deep proprioceptive input um, and carries around a backpack. And at first we were like, seriously, how much stuff are you putting in this backpack? Hmm. And then one day it dawned on us that she really needed that deep muscle input, especially in situations that sometimes can get loud yeah. and crazy. Like she doesn't need it at home when we're all just kind of at home doing stuff. But when we're going somewhere where it might be a little louder, um, and so she's she's been able to um, just kind of meet her own sensory needs in that way. So, so there's some uh, affirmation of your divide and conquer strategy, Kayla. Okay, good. Yeah. And then uh, we got one more here, and I think this has to be the last one since we're hour and five minutes in. Um, you can, uh, of course, can email us at info at onebeinghappyhome.com if if you have a question or reach out on Facebook or Twitter. Um, how do we mitigate the mood when a teenager or any age appears to want to sabotage family gatherings or refuses to join typically happy gatherings, even Christmas morning? So um, I don't know. Um, I have a thought, um, and it may be in stark contrast. So I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in stark contrast. Well, I would say my first thing is why, what's the why behind the behavior? Yeah. So chase the need behind it why is it too hard is it emotionally just really challenging for that kid and they shut down because most of the time when we have these sabotaging behaviors there's a need behind it it's not just moody teenager it's it's i am um, i'm overwhelmed with the stress of the situation i'm overwhelmed with the emotions that i'm feeling at this time and so if we can figure out what the why behind it is and then figure out ways to help that child feel connected. So maybe that child wants to stay in their room on Christmas morning and you are not going to spend the whole time trying to get that kid out of their room so that you can have a nice Christmas. You're not going to yell and scream at them and say, hey, you got to come down and join it. It's a family activity. But instead, maybe you're going to bring that child's special gift to their room and say, hey, I would love to see you open this gift. Yeah. Um, or, hey, we're going to have... Um, dinner as a family, would you like to come down or can I bring you a plate? Yeah. Um, and so recognizing that it's a really hard time um, for our kids and recognizing how that trauma does impact our kids, um, just being really um, compassionate towards our kids, especially at this time, and almost pretending that it's the first time it's ever happened yeah. because sometimes we can go, Oh my gosh, they're doing it again. And mm. I'm so tired of it. And I just want one nice Christmas memory where all my children are in the room and everybody's smiling. And I don't want anybody to smash a toy. I don't want anybody to throw something across the room because they hated it. I don't want anybody to refuse to come out of their room. Right. I mean, we don't want those things to happen, but if we can look at it with eyes of compassion and we can really truly look at what the need could be behind that. Um, I think we can be okay with it not being our picture perfect Christmas. Yeah. Okay. So that's not in stark contrast. Because <laughs> well, what I was going to, I was going to say, I just want to echo some of those things that I think one of the shifts that we've made in 2018 in our home that I'm really pleased with is we used to say years ago, what do you want? And then we realized we should ask, what do you need? But I think we've gone even next level on that now. And now we ask our kids, um, how can I help you? Or why is this hard for you? You know, with my daughter the other day, I said, baby, why is this hard for you? And she was able to to, to get some words out uh, about that because it reminds them. Um, if we ask them, how can I help you? It reminds them that we're there to help them. It yeah, reminds us team. that we're, yeah, it reminds us we're there to help them. Yeah. But why is this hard for you? Uh, in that moment, they hear us recognize that it's hard for them, mm -hmm. which is so great in connection building. I know this is hard for you. Because what if, what if your joy on Christmas morning reminds them of the person who used to beat them four days a week and throw them into the wall or maybe withhold food from them mm -hmm. for a lock in the pantry? What if that person was just joy filled on Christmas morning, mm -hmm. right? Because um, just because it's joy, one man's joy is another man's sorrow, right? Yeah. Or, or, or one adult's joy is a traumatized kid's sorrow. You know, I love... Um, I love I love doing um, sort of ex not experiments um, case um, 
focus groups with the family. So I came home a couple of weeks ago and, and, and I sat down and Kayla was sitting at the dining room table doing emails or something. And um, I, I walked into the kitchen, got a wooden spoon and put it on the table. And I said, Kayla, what's that remind you of? And she said, food. And I said, could you be a little bit more specific about the food menu? And she said, yeah, it reminds me of uh, cooking for my grandmother. I used to stir the pots um, when she made like jams and stuff mm. with a spoon. And uh, I said, okay, ask me what it reminds me of. And she said, what does it remind you of? I said, um, my mother hitting us when we didn't behave in the grocery store. Mm. Right? And it's still the same wooden spoon. And I think that sometimes we rec- – so I like to call that the wooden spoon test. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes we fail to recognize that one person's joy is another person's sorrow. And we try to transpose our childhood experiences onto our, children's and, onto our children. And when they don't react the way we think they should, well, then there's a bigger issue. And maybe just taking that step back and recognizing that this may not actually be a joyful moment for them. He could be missing grandma. I mean, the stuff we talked about an hour ago. He could be missing grandma. He could be missing his birth mom. And so let's just, um, and it's okay. It's okay if Christmas is not a joyful morning. Yeah. It took us a long time to realize that. But sometimes yeah. we just have to sit in the sorrow for a little bit. Because some, because it's, it's between bad and sad for a lot of our kids. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we just kind of got to sit in the sorrow. And, and, and people may ask, well, you know, that's really hard when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, that Jesus would, would allow that what would jesus say about that and i don't know what jesus would say about that but i do know that if you were sad he'd be sad yeah and 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 if if he was in the room with our kids who don't want to participate he'd go over and hang out with them yep so um we heard something really great at church yesterday (laughs) the pastor said you know what the problem is y'all like jesus you just don't want to be like jesus yeah and it was hard i mean yesterday's sermon was really super hard for me because of that and so and so I think, you know, be like Jesus this Christmas. And I don't mean like, be like an infant. <laughs> be like the adult version of Jesus. Who's Not kind and caring baby Jesus. and compassionate. Yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's it, gang. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, thanks very much.